to a conversation on spasticity and treatment and examination ideas um, as part of the answering some of the questions um, as part of the stroke corner and conversations through the ANPT um, and the stroke SIG. Uh, Dr. Lynn Johnson and myself, um, uh, Dr. Rachel Studer Burns will be having a conversation and go through some different videos and things to um, hopefully shed some light on spasticity and treatment ideas moving forward. Lynn, we, we've seen a lot of these different patients in, in clinic. They come in and either they're having difficulty moving their arm or moving their leg. Um, it looks like it's in a, it's, it's spasticity. It looks like they're having a hard time um, straightening it out or in some some um, aspects being able to, you know, really bend it for, for um, good um, swing and, and gait. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's pretty common, especially with patients that come in post-stroke, if they're having difficulty walking, um, just kind of clearing that affected limb because it's either difficulty with bending the knee or lifting the toes. And I feel like in school, we kind of just talk about spasticity as being like that major cause for that. You know, what's kind of interesting is, is when I, <clears throat> after all the time that I spent in the clinic, I, I got really interested in this because I was like, you know, you can't treat spasticity, right? That's what we hear over and over again. And there's not too much that you can do about it. And so I started to kind of dig into it a little bit more. And, and what I what I started to find out was is that it reminded me that there's this kind of the spectrum that, that we see and that our patients present in very different ways based on the kind of damage that they've had. You know, we go back and we think about, wow, you know, depending on the location of the stroke, we're going to see some different outcomes. We're going to see some different things. Or the question that it made me ask was, okay, so, so tone, so is it tone where it's like, you know, they just, just rest in these positions and they don't necessarily know how to inhibit it or, or relax that positioning that they have? Or is it truly like spasticity where it's velocity dependent? It has that, like, you know, when you go to test it, it, it actually tightens up and, and we, there's not too much that we can do as far as, you know, maintaining that, you know, we can create these little windows of time to be able to, um, you know, intervene with the patient. But most of the time, you know, their, their positioning creates, you know, hygiene issues or it creates gait issues, or, you know, it creates a lot of these different, these different problems. And, you know, historically there's been all these different conversations about, well, spasticity technically is something that we just see when we test the upper motor neurons. It, it's just, um, it's something that is just a piece of either Clonus or Babinski or something along those lines. What's your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that we talk about spasticity as being that velocity dependent. Um, but then when it comes to the application, we have, I mean, in school, I think that it's hard to get that application. We get it in, you know, once we go out into clinicals and things, and then even, you know, starting practice, you go out and you see people that actually have that increased tone. And it's, it's difficult to determine which one it is. I feel like we've kind of just used spasticity as a big umbrella term. And I feel like it's in the research, you know, it, it shows up as everybody terms it as spasticity. And it mm -hmm. kind of makes you wonder, though, without being able to truly identify, is it spasticity or is it just that they have increased tone and they don't necessarily really know how to move out of those patterns that they've, that they've learned? Because those tonal patterns are so strong um, mm -hmm. and they're in a lot of ways, they're functional. You know, they're, they're compensatory patterns that, that really work for the patient. And, and then it makes it even really more difficult because, you know, early right after stroke, right, if they learn those patterns, now that's their new normal. And so trying to untrain their new normal is really very difficult. Um, you know, you're, you're basically trying to teach them what they feel like in their brain, right, is like compensation. But like, you know, so it's, it's interesting. The other thing that it made me kind of think about as I went through is, okay, so is it tone? Is it spasticity or is it a synergy? You know, because a lot of this, this population for movement efficiency moves in these, in these um, synergies. And so, you know, when you're looking at the patient, how do you decide, you know, is this truly spasticity? Is it maybe just some hypertonia or is it, does it fall more along in the lines of like a synergy? I'll show you, this is one of my favorites. This is one of my, one of my ladies that um, I've worked with over the years. And um, this is, this is kind of her transfer and kind of how she moves. You know, kind of that very like typical, um, you know, it looks like it's spasticity um, movement pattern. 
And then here she is. I asked her to move her arm and it still looks, you know, like there's, you know, that, that spasticity component or this tone, her leg goes up. She's got an associated reaction there. Um, you know, so she's, she's all connected. Um, and then what was really cool though, is I asked her, Hey, can you move your arm over here? Good. And then can you open your hand? Good. And then can you bring your wrist up? Excellent. Towards Mark over here. Good. And then can you open your hand? Good. And then can you bring your wrist up? Excellent. That whole thing made me wonder, like, is what we're seeing, you know, if I ask you to move, is there an opportunity that maybe it isn't spasticity? It looks like it, it walks like it. But when we start to break it up and go, well, can you move? Maybe they can move out of those like synergy components. It's just so effortful for them to move um, and lacking strength and all those other things. And then the last thing I'll just say is, is that I went, of course, went back into the research and evidence and found that um, <clears throat> oftentimes that flexion, that flexion synergy um, overshadows um, flex or spasticity um, in chronic and severe um, hemipretic stroke. So just a cool article if you get a chance to, to take a look at it if you haven't already. So what do you think about that, those videos? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's pretty typical um, of a lot of the patients that I've seen as well. And I think we get so caught up in that, you know, spasticity terminology. I'll have a patient that comes in, I'll do kind of like manual muscle testing specific motion. And then when they actually go to do that functional movement, like a transfer or even gait, you kind of just forget that they can actually do those individual movements on their own and kind of just chalk it all up to whatever their tone problem is. Yeah. I went back through and um, looked up at the, where we are right now, as far as like the pathophysiological considerations for what we're seeing, you know, and basically in the spinal cord population, you know, we see that there are a lot of like, you know, spinal pathways. And then also in the stroke population, there's super spinal pathways that are, that they see as, as part of the cause, you know, those spinal causes are, you know, damage to the anterior horn cells and muscle spindles and things like that, you know, the sensory information that we're getting. Um, and then the supraspinal components after stroke, we see them, you know, we see damage in the motor areas, um, you know, due to the MCA or because of the, uh, you know, in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, which we see, you know, quite a bit. And those, the, that population really is a lot more impaired. And, and, you know, research, of course, shows that there's these like powerful, like inhibitory centers that help to regulate tone that get interrupted. And so what we, what we see then as the output is these mo movement patterns that don't necessarily, um, aren't as coordinated as we want them to be. The sensory information that they're getting is somehow not making it, isn't making it to the location that we want it to, as far as being able to, um, to regulate it, to be able to understand it. Um, and so uh, we see these, these, diff these, these different uh, patterns. So it is different between the spinal cord population and the patient's post-stroke, and it affects those fine motions and, and those kinds of things that we see. There's also the reticulospinal tract, which they're doing a ton more research on is trying to figure out um, its, its role in this whole conversation. Um, and I think that that's going to be something interesting to kind of watch as the research um, moves, moves forward. So there, there's the clinical features that we see because of the impairments. But then at the same time, what we see is, is you know, all these like kind of other secondary components as far as like anger, um, you know, emotion regulation and all those kinds of things are all, all connected kind of into this process. Um, and so as we, as we step back and look at our patients, you know, at a bigger level, you know, is there more to the story, you know, kind of what we're, what we're talking about right now, as far as when we're looking at our patients, um, than just the fact that maybe they're having some spasticity and that's the best that their movement's going to look. You know, what we see in clinic is we see that immobility, we see those muscle spasms that make it hard for them to sleep. You know, we see um, decreased ability for voluntary and fractionated movement, um, which makes makes it really difficult for them to reach stuff off the of shelves or to be able to put their foot where they want to when they do their transfer or, um, you know, to be able to, to coordinate that when they're when the inhibition in the system is isn't acting the way that we want it to. So I think that's why we see those things as well as, you know, I, I kind of hang out on that. I really like paying attention to the sensation, 
you know, most of our patients post stroke, there's some kind of sensory motor, you know, some kind of like somatic sensation that's kind of altered that it kind of changes their, um, their muscle patterns as well. That's kind of the thought process that I've had so far anyway, is trying to go back and, and look at what does the evidence tell us? You know, what are the, what are the scientists looking at so far as to help us figure out next steps moving forward? And so, I mean, kind of with all of that, I wanted to try and put that together with uh, application in the clinic, using what we know from the evidence, how can we kind of make sure that we're evaluating for spasticity um, or really any kind of tone abnormality, especially with somebody post-stroke, just like any other patient, you know, we want to start with that history and subjective. We know that the prevalence of lower limb spasticity for stroke is between 40 and 600 per 100,000. So it's not as common as everyone that's had a stroke is going to have spasticity, but it is still common enough that we want to make sure we're checking for it. We also want to just ask those questions. Some of the things that are more specific to spasticity would be if the symptoms fluctuate throughout the day, because there can be that kind of temporal first thing in the morning might be worse, later in the evening might be worse. And then any increases with stress, temperature change, or other changes to like sensory um, inputs. Those are all things that would kind of trigger that thought process that this might be spasticity as opposed to something different. The biggest way that we use in the clinic for measuring spasticity is going to be the modified Ashworth scale. Kind of in the research, there are some other different ways to look at spasticity, but if we're talking about going through an evaluation, we're checking for lots of different things. We want something that's going to be pretty quick, give us a, an objective number. So a rating scale like the Ashworth scale is helpful. And then there's also been a lot of studying to find reliability of the modified Ashworth scale for lots of different patient groups, including people who had a stroke. So this is just for the lower extremity. Um, I know Rachel and I talked about this ahead of time. In our PTOT world, we usually focus on lower extremity versus upper extremity. This kind of goes through all of the different test positions, um, what the examiner is doing. But big picture, you, if you're testing a muscle for spasticity, you want to take it to its shortened length and then move it into that maximum length and position. Um, and because spasticity is velocity dependent, we wanna go very quickly um, to kind of see if there is any increase in tone, a catch, um, if you're even able to move it at all, kind of looking for that quick movement, shortened to lengthened. So if you're testing plantar flexors, all the way into plantar flexion, and then the other direction. Yeah, and so, I mean, for our numbers, the modified Ashworth scale, it's a zero to four scale, basically just going through where you see those increases in the muscle tone, zero meaning no increase in tone throughout, and then four meaning that it's rigid in either flexion or extension. So not being able to move it when you apply that quick velocity. And then kind of throughout, there's some different differences. You're looking for if there's a catch, if there's resistance, if you can actually move it through that full range of motion. Well, hey, Lynn, thanks for having a conversation with me today about spasticity. Um, hopefully it's helped us both and we'll, we'll grow in our, our treatment. Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like I learned a lot just by trying to kind of prepare for having the discussion. Um, and hopefully this is helpful for everybody else.
Um, don't forget that we do have a question box on the student corner page. Um, so if you have questions either about spasticity or about anything else, you can kind of drop those in, send them to us and we can try and make more videos and help out.